got to believe history. Uh, that doesn't speak well for your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, we're, we're, listen, we're here. we're new, but I think we could do this for another 20 years, and I think you'd still be one of the most prestigious guests we've ever had nice. because you are a, uh, a Mets legend, and I'm liking the beard, Howie. You're uh, – you're letting it in, huh? You know what? It's called, you've heard of Beast of Burden. This is my beard of boredom. <laughs> <laughs> you are a wordsmith, man. I've never man. done it before. Yeah? Seriously. I, I have no problem admitting my age. I'm 66 years old, and I've never grown a beard before. And the shame of it is that most people who shave at like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning will have a better looking beard by five o'clock that day than this thing after three weeks. <laughs> I, I just started myself too. I grew one for the first time in January and it's uh it's a whole new world when your beard versus no beard is like a life change. It's itchy, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, uh, everyone keeps telling me you, you just got to get past the itchy part and then it's yeah. great. And I'm like, well, when the hell does that happen? Well, for me, it's as long as I get the mosquitoes out of there in time to go to bed, I'm all right. <laughs> oh, my God. Kind of, you're Kevin, right? The guy in the middle is Kevin. Yes, sir. And the and fellow I, with I'm, the headphones on is? I'm Clem. You're Clem, right. Clem. I was just and, testing you guys. I wanted to see if your brains melted during this thing. It's, so you know who you are. My brain's melted, and I have to say this. This isn't, you know, hyperbole. This isn't saying anything just because you're. we're so happy to have you on the show. Yeah. Hearing your voice. Oh. Actually makes things feel better. Like I oh, feel like so nice. I feel like I'm in the alternate reality where everything's good. The Mets just lost to the Braves in a heartbreaking loss last night, and I know <laughs> that Howie's going to be there tomorrow with us to get our hearts broken again. So just thank you for coming on. We're thrilled to My have pleasure. you. And that voice, man, those it, it really is though. I mean, uh, I, I've said the only thing. What are we that there, Clem? Coors Light, the official sponsor of Gotta Believe Podcast, right here. Listen, We're chilling it, with it, Coors Light. It's almost, almost it's almost noon. It's almost the PM, so it doesn't. <laughs> time is just a, a suggestion right now, Howie. You can, you know, AM, PM, day, night, so weekend, weekday. It's all the same. It's five o'clock somewhere. It's five o'clock everywhere during quarantine. That's yeah. the new rule, right? That's yeah, the problem. <laughs> I. I uh, <laughs> I, I really mean this, and I've said it many times before. As Mets fans, you know, there's been a, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of ups and downs. The only thing that we can count on, and we can count on it in a major way, is the broadcast team, both television and radio. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like you guys are the best in the business, and it's not, a, you know, a bias or, or exaggeration. I mean, you guys are as good as it gets all the way through. Well, first of all, Kevin, I appreciate that. Secondly, I feel blessed to be a part of it. And thirdly, and just as importantly right now, you know, the stuff I've just gotten so many nice comments the last few days since I went on Twitter. I'm thinking I'm in the wrong place. It's Twitter. It's <laughs> I was going to say it's, it's been what, you know? like three days, I something mean, like that. So give yeah. it some time. Give it some time, Howie. I, I'm sure. Well, I already <laughs> alienated the Steely Dan fan club the other day, but you know, that's OK. I was just testing the waters on that. But no, the big, <laughs> seriously, one of the biggest reasons I went on Twitter is that I felt so detached from you and everybody who listens to whether they enjoy it or not, but just listens to our broadcast because mm -hmm. you can feel it. You know, it's not even a it's not that you need to see who's tweeting about whom or anything. You just you know, when you're in the business, you just kind of know when you've connected to a certain extent. And I feel that that connection has been at least temporarily severed. Mm -hmm. And I miss it. There's a huge void. And so for me, going on Twitter has almost been therapeutic. <laughs> wow. I mean, you it's are. Girl, huh? uh, yeah. <laughs> Again, give it a little bit of time. I I'm interested <laughs> to see what happens during when baseball resumes because uh, they call it Mets Twitter. It's its own entity. Mets Twitter is uh, every team and every fan base of any sort has their, their sect of Twitter. But right. the Mets Twitter is one that is – loud and passionate and uh you know there's a lot of opinions to be had in baseball and when you're on yeah. the wrong side of it or disagreeing with people it can get pretty ugly well i'm just the messenger <laughs> so you know i'm not going to be doing a talk show on twitter certainly not during the game i mean I well you know. also you probably never you, you probably thought you were never going to join it in the first place so never say never how you never know well yeah, but you're missing one point. When you're broadcasting a game, your focus has to be so acute. And yeah, there are a few innings when Wayne's doing play-by-play, -play and maybe I've got a little more 
sort of wiggle room and flexibility. But I, I, at this stage of the game, I'm not great at multitasking. And if I did that, you know, if I tweeted in game, I'm afraid that I would lose a little bit of focus or get a little, as my people say, famished. But um, <laughs> we'll see. You know, you just said never say never. So I can't make, if I'm on there, I can't count anything out anymore. <laughs> we, Mike Francesa said he was never going to join Twitter, and he's right. on my feed more than like anyone else these days. He's screaming at air right now. So <laughs> we got you, we got you hooked, and Twitter gets its hooks into you. I told Alyssa, I said, get him on to the, you know, put him in our books. And by books, yeah. I mean it's like a, just a cesspool of craziness. But Mets Twitter, I mean, just like Mets fans, we're we're a crazy bunch, but it's Chicken Little Twitter. The sky yeah. is falling, and but we got to believe, right? I'm going to try to assume the role of healer you know i don't want to fan the flames mm -hmm. when things are getting a little bit hairy and i don't want to create things that don't need to be created that's okay. not why i'm on there so that I, would mean I, you... I just want to be a sounding board maybe and even that i'm not sure how deeply involved i'm going to be as far as you know i'm certainly not going to be dealing with a lot of strategic stuff I mean, well, if that if that if you're over here on one end of the spectrum, I'm on the other. Just throwing gasoline on it and just stirring the pot, and because I to me that's my therapy. I got I got to get out. You know, when they blow a save or when something goes wrong, I got to get it out in some way. If it wasn't for Twitter, I don't know where I'd be because who knows how that would manifest itself. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like you really are though, out of out of a franchise that you know, like I said, has had had uh, you know their their missteps and and a lot of heartache and a lot of opinions. I don't think I've ever heard him. I, actually, I know for a fact I've never heard a Mets fan be like, ah, I, I don't like Howie. Well, that's really sweet, too. It, it's heard, true. I mean, you know, you, you look know. at Yankee fans. I know Yankee fans who don't love their broadcast. I've heard other teams who, who don't love their home team broadcast, and I just don't think that's the case with the Mets. We all well, unanimously love you. Well, I, I appreciate that, and it comes right back at you because really we're all coming out of the same family, essentially. <laughs> And, and I mean that because, you know, my career has enabled me to become an open book, certainly when it comes to the Mets, because going back over 30 years, my goodness, it's back to 1987. So that's literally 33 years ago is when I started to connect to fans via Mets Extra, which, and you guys may even be too young to remember that. Is that possible? Do you guys even remember, remember Mets Extra? Yeah. Um, Okay, <laughs> vaguely, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh boy, you want to know why I'm growing a beard? I'm like, I got anything left I can grow. <laughs> but the um, the beauty of it for me is that I felt I connected on sort of a you know visceral level with the fans going back to 1987 because I was doing this pre and post game show which featured phone calls in the early days on both ends and. You know, I could have done it one or two ways. I could have been intentionally bland and played it down the middle or basically just kind of threw my resume out there and said, OK, now look at here. You know, I grew up in Bayside, Queens, a huge Mets fan. I remember the Mets since day one and I've been emotionally invested in them. And when they lose, it's going to hurt. When they win, it's going to feel in some cases euphoric. But that doesn't mean we can't discuss the issues somewhat objectively or really honestly would be the better word and and i think through that and the help that i got from people like davy johnson right off the bat who sort of played along and allowed me to ask the kinds of questions that i think the fans would want to know the answers to i think that's what sort of strengthened the bond you alluded to a little while ago but it, that's something that's so precious to me and means everything and to hear you say that is is very very yeah. nice I think that's the key. I mean, right, Clem? I think you'd agree that we, we can tell, and, and you're professional about it, but we can tell in your voice and just knowing you that it hurts when they lose and you're happy when they win. And I, I don't think anybody wants to hear, you know, the impartial broadcast anymore. We want to hear fans well, who are in the same boat as us. As long as the people delivering the game to you are telling you the truth. Right. And are being honest, because if you start making excuses and you know people can see everything, we've got enough people who listen to the game on the radio while we're at the ballpark who are watching it in real time. Right. And, you know, they know if we're candy coating something or glossing over something, then we're not giving them an accurate depiction. Now, there, there, there's two ways to do it. 
And, and one of them is not good for an announcer's longevity or frankly, even his sanity, because <laughs> if you just launch into attack mode when something goes wrong and you just keep pouncing on it and beating it, and beating it to pieces, then what happens is, you know, you've alienated certain people in your audience too. Never just mind the player oh, or yeah. the organization. <laughs> um, what, you know, you just, you don't want to get to a point where you conflate the game from a talk show. Um, there's plenty of time later on for that. Mm -hmm. My job does not entail basically doing what I did when I was taking phone calls on Mets Extra. There's a huge difference. And I like this one a whole lot better than that one, to be honest with you, because there's nothing like broadcasting a game real time. Trust me, oh, it's the best. I, I couldn't even fathom. And like Kevin said, too, the Mets fans, the, you know your own. You can see in someone's eyes they've been through the ringers as a Mets fan. And I think that's what kind of makes this such a special group from the announcers and the way you got I just tell it like it is and don't can't sugarcoat anything because no one knows what it's like to be a Mets fan. It's a very unique team for, for better or worse. Right. And um, it, it kind of comes back to Kevin and I will always be, you know, crying about whatever had happened with the Mets, whether it's a game or a, like a PR nightmare or something has happened. And people, you know, our coworkers, when they used to work from home in Boston and Chicago, wouldn't really understand it. Then, like, it was funny. Our, our, our boss, Dave Portnoy, he's a, he's a Boston guy. He never – he always thought we were being chicken littles crying. This guy is falling. And he heard your your call the day after the Mr. Mech gave the finger. Mm. And, he, and it, was so, it was so reserved about how, you know – Last night, you know, fans had a little bit of a show, and you never know what you're going to see. You come to the I don't even remember what I said about oh, that. Oh, it was great. How he, said any, really? he loved it. Yeah, everyone in the office I have loved no it. No recollection because of be, that. because it was so uh, because this team has been through so much, and and that as funny as it was, that doesn't even crack like the top 100 of wacky <laughs> things that happened in the Mets. So the way you did it was just like. Uh, you know, like Mr. Met put on a, a little bit of a show for the fans and the 2-1 pitch. Like, you just kept going, <laughs> and it was just like, yeah, another day at the ballpark here. But then you leave it alone, right? I don't think I dwell on that. Yeah, no, 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 you definitely you just you just kept it moving. And we yeah. were selling T-shirts. We're going crazy. The fans can't get enough. And Howie just, like, you know, just, just dropped it into the broadcast. No problem. But you know what? You know what the beauty of it is? And this is that connection I was alluding to before. We, meaning all of us, you know, Gary, Keith, Ron, Wayne, and myself – we can say stuff in that way, and it's almost with a little subliminal wink and a smile, right? Mm -hmm. Because absolutely, we just sort of get it. Absolutely, so we, don't need, we don't need to be expansive. We don't need to tear it up. We just need to kind of say, "Hey, you know what happened last night?" Right. Oh, it's all sweet, just. Wasn't it? It's a little and then you like. Move on. Yep, a little reference. You allude to this, you know, allude to that, and and the fans just. It's it's like speaking a language. Like we speak. Mets and and we know it and you guys do it so well and it's so you kept saying you keep saying the word beauty and I really think that they're the game of baseball has such big pageantry and history and then I think the broadcast adds so much of that and well thank you I I feel I mean I, I when I was in college I worked at uh at the radio WFUV and I I tried my hand at play by play and I, I was doing uh the Brooklyn Cyclones just recording on a on a tape cassette just for yes. practice. That's the way we all started, though. I, I was, I was uh, Warner Wolf. I met him that night, and it was like a beautiful night, oh, yeah, and like gosh. you know, overlooking Coney Island. And there oh, was, yeah. and I remember thinking, like, this is like beautiful. Maybe that sounds corny or a little like yeah. over the top, but it's like there's something about baseball and the and the way you broadcast that it's like art. Well. Thank you. I appreciate that. I've got nowhere to go, but thank you. <laughs> and it, it, it really is like we are Mets fans. I feel like we're the family that like the parents, they don't really take care of us sometimes. And we're kind of just <laughs> left to our own accord. And we have cousins, like the announcers are the cousins oh. and the brothers and the sisters. And even the fans, I'm telling you, out of all the things I do at Barstool, I get no, I get like, the. I, I think Kevin's probably the same. We get more like you guys speak exactly the way I think and talk yeah. to my friends and my dad and my mom and all this kind of stuff. And it, it makes me so proud. But I think it's just this team has done it to us where we're the only ones in the foxhole. Because I know, we know <laughs> the people across town in the million dollar mansion across the street aren't feeling bad for us. They're laughing at us. And right, when you, and, and someone just said this in the chat, when you give them a the little extra, put it in the books after a Yankees <laughs> win, it just, it kind of just lifts. Me what, to like another what, level. What's your favorite put in the books? Do you have one that sticks out? Because I have a very specific one. Yeah, I think I do. What, what's yours? <laughs> I think I do. 
And I have a feeling we may be on the same page here because Clemens has brought up the Yankees. Yeah. The game in 2006 where they fell behind Randy Johnson, I think four runs in the first inning, and come back to win the game. David Wright drove one off of Mariano Rivera over Johnny Damon's head. Yeah. And I was so excited that I just said, Put that in your, in your books. The Mets, <laughs> the Mets beat Mariano. Put yeah. that in your books. It was might have been so good. Read between the lines on that one. Too, you know. <laughs> yep. But hey, that's what I was feeling. Yeah. Went with it, and and that's to me the one that sticks out the most. I, w- I wish it was, you know, a, uh, a World Series call or a playoff clincher, but I'll yeah. take it in the Subway Series. You and know? you know you know what was so poignant about that? And, and you're not going to realize this, of course, but um, a, a really good friend of mine who I'd grown up with in Bayside, Queens, named Steve Tilzer, um, was literally on his deathbed at that time. And as I was driving to the ballpark the following day, it was a Saturday afternoon game, against the Yankees. And as I'll never forget this, I was pulling off the LIE at the Grand Central Interchange and I got a call from Steve's brother, Dave, to tell me that Steve had passed, but they had the radio on in his hospital room and he lived just long enough to hear David Wright hit that home, uh, hit that ball over David's head to win the game. That's and so about. that always has just another layer of very, very special significance to me. It was such a glorious night for the Mets. And yet when I think back, I think of it in such bittersweet, uh, in yeah. such bittersweet terms. I feel like that's baseball. You know, people relate, you know, some, some truly, you know, important stuff in life alongside baseball it just it, if it means that much to you it's just yeah. as important as anything else in your life but you you know so when 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 david wright wins uh when the mets win and it's things are great it's all gravy you've also you've also been working through some some seasons you know 100 lost seasons where i can imagine when you're on the road in you know late august early september 30 games out and you know you just gotta do another nine innings that's a that's a level of commitment. You're on the road. You're away from your family. You know mm-hmm. you've, you've done 120 games so far, and it's the same guys, and you know mm-hmm. you're gonna lose, and yet you still come with the same like enthusiasm. How does that? How do you even muster that up after how many years? 30 plus years. I'll, I'll give you a couple of different ways to look at it. One is that Bob Murphy used to say this all the time in his inimitable way. He, well, of course, now I'll try to imitate it. But um, he said, you never know what you might see if you come to a big league ball game. True. And so when I was driving to Shea Stadium, pardon me, to City Field on June 1st, 2012, I didn't know Johan Santana was going to pitch a no-hitter. Mm-hmm. Anytime you sit down behind that microphone or with a headset mic, to do a game, you have no idea what's coming after that first pitch. Nothing mm-hmm. is, is preordained or scripted. So somebody could hit four home runs, somebody could drive in 10 runs, somebody could pitch a no hitter, or you never know. So that in and of itself is enough motivation to get you from one game to the next. But I have a little trick that I use specifically at home. And that is, there's a picture, a big frame picture in our booth, which is named for Bob Murphy. And that picture, which is, um, you know, we've had it up there for a long time, but it was taken, ironically enough, in an early season 1969 or before an early season 1969 game, just as it turned out. But it's a picture of Lindsey Nelson, Bob Murphy, and Ralph Kiner, the original Mm. three broadcasters who I, I trust you guys don't remember, but... Well, we all grew up with Ralph, though. I mean, Ralph Kiner's was, corner. Yeah, yeah, Kiner's Corner was a big uh, part of our, our growing up. Those guys, you got to remember back then, uh, the TV and, and radio guys were the same. It was just those right. three. And they would switch off going from the radio booth to the TV booth. Crazy. It, you know, in every game, that's the way it worked. It was fun. Yeah. I'd love to do that once just to, to experience that. But um, we have that picture up in the booth. And if the game is dragging or the the Mets are eight runs behind, or we're in the 14th inning and we're in the middle of a maybe lost season, and you get that feeling where your adrenaline really starts to sink, and you're thinking, boy, I kind of wish this thing would, would end, this game. I look over at that picture, and as I'm talking to you now, that picture would be over my right shoulder. And I, I literally 
once or twice in a game like that will turn around and just look at that picture. I don't have to stare at it. I just look at it. And it's like this instant jolt of energy that I get because it reminds me not only how proud I am to be doing what I'm doing on that night, but how incredibly proud I am to be part of the lineage that mm. began with Lindsey, Bob, and Ralph. And that is, for me, an instant reset. And I mean instant. And if I, if I just need a jolt to let me know, you better appreciate where you are, big boy. Uh, <laughs> looking at that picture doesn't. Our boss tells us how rich he is and how lucky we are to have, you know, <laughs> to have jobs, and he'd be nothing without him. So, yeah, I'm I'm gonna find a picture that will do that. Can I? Can, can you get, take a picture of that and send it to me? And I'll look at. Uh, <laughs> that will help you. That I'll look at Bob. You. <laughs> you, you mentioned the uh, the difference with TV and and radio, and and I really feel like you and Gary were, you know, probably the greatest radio combo ever. When when SNY came about, was there any? Uh, any talks of you doing TV or was there any, uh, you know, resentment? If you want, did you want it? Did you, or you're a no, radio guy? I, I mean, I, I didn't know anything about the process cause I wasn't involved in it. I knew there was going to be an SNY and to be uh, candid about how things have evolved with me. Um, I started doing TV for the Mets in 96. And back then it was on the old sports channel. So it was the cable package, and it was for 75 games. Um, I had just signed that summer to do the Islanders, and that deal was going to be obviously a full hockey season, but my contract called for X number, and it was a pretty large number, but not a huge number, of other events. And I thought, and we all kind of knew that would involve the Mets in some way. We just didn't know how. But what I didn't know at the time was that they were going to make a change in the booth, and, and Rusty left. And mm -hmm. so they came to me and said, would you like to do the Mets too? And I said, boy, that's a big, big hit. You know, a full hockey season and now 75 baseball games. But yeah, that's about enough. Okay. And um, I mean, you don't say no to a major league baseball job. Right, mind. right. <laughs> so yeah, of course I did it. And then the next year, Sports Channel had an option to go up to 100 games, which they did, making it an even more intense schedule. And um, anyway, long story short, I did that for I don't know, six, seven, eight years, whatever it was. But along the way, during that period, I would occasionally get a not too subtle hint from one or two of the higher up executives in the Mets organization that, and I quote, you know, Bob Murphy is not going to be here forever, probably not that much longer. And if it's something you'd be willing to consider, we think you'd be a good fit in the radio booth looking down the road. And, you know, ownership is behind this. And, you know, I had mixed emotions about it, obviously. Um, but what I leaned on was the fact that Bob was taken off of TV completely in 19... You didn't know that, huh? Bob, <laughs> Bob was taken off of television for the 1982 season. And he was crestfallen. But in those days, especially, you know, cable was still kind of getting started. Not everybody had Sports Channel, nor would they have cable access on the basis they have it now for a number of years. So the radio audience was huge back then, mm -hmm. especially as the Mets got better in 84 and beyond. But it turned out to be maybe the best thing that happened to Murph's career. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when they finally told me after uh, Murph, as soon as Murph retired and he announced it during 03, I said, well, I have a feeling I'm going to be hearing something from somebody pretty soon. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that took, you know, a few months of working some things out. But um, my producer on the Islanders with Sports Channel back then, or later on, MSG, Kevin Meininger, who's just one of the greatest people I've ever met in this business, and I consider a dear friend. Um, we had dinner in Montreal before an Islander game one night, and he said, this is going to be the greatest thing. You wait and see. This, it, it was great for Murph. It's going to be great for you. Um, and so, you know, I, it was a little uncomfortable at first to, to make that transition, but it's worked out great. I have no complaints. I, I still feel like, uh, you know, obviously just modern day, you put on the game on the TV, but there'll be times I'm sitting at home and I just prefer to listen to the radio. You know, I, certainly in the car or when you're traveling or whatever, but there's something about 
uh, uh, listening to a baseball game. And there's just so I think I think it's the the most interesting of all broadcasts because there's so much downtime, and it really is more yeah. about you storytelling and and filling that air with like you know great tidbits. And I mean, you gotta you gotta know a lot of shit to be able to fill a you know four hour and and especially when you know with the Mets who seem to go extra innings like every other night, it feels like <laughs> you know you you uh, do you ever just run out of stuff? Are you ever just like I've I've said all well, I have to. You know what? What happens, and you really have to watch it, is that you can start to get a little silly in a situation where the game is probably out of reach one way or the other. Right. It's dragging. You're into the late innings, but pitching change after pitching change. Or, yeah. You know, the game just takes on one of those sort of um, – sort of those games where just nothing much is going on and you've re you could either leave a ton of dead air which i don't like to do or you could just find stuff and i've been blessed with partners over the years who will go anywhere i mean one night wayne hagan started singing the lyrics to the bonanza theme song, <laughs> an old tv show i didn't even know there were words <laughs> and he came up with them so it's, you know it's little things like that but let me do a quick tiny bit of market research here when you say you know the games on tv but you guys are listening at home i'm just curious because it's such a new world and I'm, I'm always interested on how people get the content now are you listening on an old transistor radio uh, game day audio are you listening via the radio.com app on your phone i got the uh the mlb at bat yeah. app i think it's called yeah, yeah i got i got that yeah. app there are times game too audio. There are times that I'll just uh, hop in the car too, which I know is crazy, but I'll just start driving around. <laughs> just but the yeah, game? yeah I'll, yeah. I will hop in the car and listen to a few innings just because on like a summer night, it's it's just uh, I and when I was younger, I did actually have a transistor radio, which I used to just get roasted for. My roommates, when I was fresh out of college, I would sit in the backyard with a with a, with a like you know a battery powered transistor radio, and my friends were like, "What are you, eighty five years old, dude?" But <laughs> I, 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 it's, I love it. I mean, and I'm kind of a nerd. Like I said, when I was in college, I was, I was trying to do it. So I was kind of a radio nerd and I still am with like sports talk. So I, I take an interest in the broadcast itself, but yeah, the, the app is, uh, is clutch for me. Yeah. I'm in, the, I'm in the same boat. I have the app and I'll just walk around and I'll just sit outside the TV. I could see the TV from like my porch, but I'll just listen again. You paint the picture in your head kind of does more. Sometimes you don't want to see the actual carnage right. that the Mets are inflicting on your soul. Now you're you know, listening on the app. You said, right? Yeah. I'll listen on the app. And I, I, I still have an old transistor radio and I have a rocking chair on the back. And oh, I think wow. my kids are like, dad's old. Like this is officially the point where I've become a dad. I people say, Mr. You know, Mr. Clemenza to me instead of saying, you know, whatever can, can your daughter come out the place. So yeah. So don't worry. You're dealing with some old souls here. That's that's and like Kev yeah. said, even I have to say, when I hear that Mets broadcast, even if it's like a little cold, I just need to roll the window down. It just needs to have the whole summer feel to it. Yeah. So the I'll, air flowing. Yep. Yeah. I'll wear a jacket into the car so I can roll the window down as Howie kind of paints the picture of what's going on at City Field at any given moment. That's great. Now yeah. we are old souls, and so we did it. We did an episode last week talking about the potential. I believe pie in the sky idea for baseball this year. And, you know, we're all eager to watch, watch the game and see it on TV again, but we were kind of uh, against this Frankenstein baseball idea with all the rule changes they were going to have to implement. Where, where are you on the idea that they floated out there last week? Well, look, I want to see baseball as badly as anybody. And, if it means playing in ballparks, no fans, which is becoming increasingly um, the likely format. Probable, yeah. Uh, that's that's fine, but I still I – mean, it's not fine. It's it's terrible, but it's if that's all we're going to get – Beggars can't be choosers. Yeah. That's the format or that's the context in which I say that's fine. But I personally, just for myself – have so many reservations about the Arizona plan. I mean, let, let's look at it pragmatically now. Um, anybody could get this thing. We all know that. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the Mets broadcasters, with the exception of Wayne, who's just a young pup, is, um, you know, in a more vulnerable age bracket. And so, God forbid, one of us come down with this thing while we're sequestered in a hotel. Mm. Well, you've got to be quarantined. Let's just assume you, you live through it. You've got to be quarantined for 
X number of days, well, how are you going to eat? They're going to be bringing room service up and leaving it outside your door. Okay. So you open the door, you bring your tray in. Nobody's coming in to clean your room. Nobody's mm -hmm. coming in to take your tray. Two meals a day, three meals a day. You're going to have, you're going to have dishes and stuff stacked up along every wall. The, the room's going to get dusty. That's just one basic, tiny little thing. But, you know, some of the other stuff, I mean, not being able to utilize the dugout for players to sit next to. They'd be sitting in the stands and they're talking about expanding the rosters. I mean, manager would have to call up to the upper deck to, to get a <laughs> you know, the way that, that's going. I just, I just would, would you be – if you could uh, – the actual game itself, like the ideas of the seven-inning doubleheaders, yeah. the electronic yeah. umpires, uh, what are your thoughts on the actual gameplay they proposed? Well, let's take them one at a time. The seven inning double headers, I think, would be born of necessity to try to get as many games in. Right. And I, I would be very supportive of that. Would it you? Means, I feel like seven innings is like well, you're he's radically. A Mets fan. I, yeah. I know. I mean, I, you know, it's good for us. Hey, less bullpen is always a good thing for the New York Mets. But, uh, you know, yeah, Jacob DeGrom maybe can finally get some wins under his belt if he pitches on double header right. days. But I feel like that's radically changing. Sure, it is. You but, know, but, seven but, innings. But we go into this season, and hopefully only this one, by <laughs> acknowledging okay, this is unique. So we've got baseball this way this year, or we've got nothing. If ever you were going to experiment and fool around yeah. with different ideas that have been floated, look, we're all going to be so elated at getting baseball back that you can just devise a checklist. Seven inning double headers, you see a few of them, like it, dislike it. Mm -hmm. uh, robotic umps, I'm, uh, I'm not sold on it because what I heard in the Atlantic League last year was a virtual disaster. Um, was it, it? It wasn't even, yeah, it wasn't even close. In, in what regards? Like it just, the technology didn't wrong. work? I mean, yeah. It was so yeah. blatantly wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that I would, I have no interest in seeing robotic umps anytime soon. Um, but then you look into things like, uh, I, I don't love home run derby to, to end an extra inning game just because I hate the NHL shootout with such passion. Mm -hmm. I always would, would joke about how bad the shootout is by saying, well, they don't do a home run derby to, you know, <laughs> right. a major league now they might be game. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, no, I would hate that. Now they want to put a, a, a player on second base in the 10th inning. I'd be more intrigued by that mm -hmm. than I would by home run derby. I just, I never get caught up. in home run derby. I, I'm okay with a, a, a couple tweaks here and there. The, my thing was that if it, it all happened at once for the very first time in a shortened season and when there's a lot worse things going, it just, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I said this, if we play and the Yankees win the world series, this season does not count, put an asterisk <laughs> on everything. And if the Mets are somehow good, this was totally normal baseball. Everything counts. Right. So, right. So, that's, so that, there's what happens. So you get an 80 or 100 game season. The Mets win the whole thing, and you're going to spend the rest of your life hearing from people who are trying to delegitimize it. That, Bad I mean. you got to deal with the Santana no-hitter that way. <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. It's, like, it's like, do I even want that? Because I'll just hear forever how it didn't count from uh, the Crosstown Rivals. But uh, what, what, So you've, you've been in, since 87, you said. So mm -hmm. you unfortunately missed that 86 year. Um, but since then, and by the way, those uniforms in 87, how come they don't ever, how come that was a one year thing? That's my favorite Mets uniform ever. And with the, the New York the, script, the New York script. I love it. How come, you know, a well, one, it was just one year. They couldn't even give it a yeah. little more. Well, because they never should have changed off of what they currently use for the road uniforms and did since their inception. See, now you've gotten me into a subject that will probably get me. <laughs> no, let's go. What do you think but, of the blacks? You like the oh, black Howie's uniforms? getting hot. I like the black, it. There's, a, there's a big push for the black uniforms right now. Where does Howie fall in the blacks? I would like to see every one of those black jerseys taken out to a bonfire. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. I'm, I'm, sorry, Pete Alonso. You're wrong. Okay. It's terrible. I, let's go back. You talked about we all speak the same language. Well, the language says very explicitly in the song, which is really an anthem for the New York Mets and their fans, all the fans are true to the orange and blue. Do we have to put something in there parenthetically that says not black? The Mets <laughs> colors are blue and orange and white, period. And there's a great reason for it. I, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the derivation of the Mets uniform 
when the Mets were conceived uh, and played their first game in 1962. The pinstripes were taken from the Yankees. Their, their uniform pays tribute or homage to all three of their predecessors in New York. The blue is an homage to the Dodgers. The orange is an homage to the Giants. History, you don't outgrow history. History is exactly what it is. Years pass, and it goes a little bit further into the, the recesses, unfortunately, of some people's minds. Um, I never liked the black jerseys. I used to fight verbally with Charlie Samuels about them all the time. And the Mets were actually a little late to the party with them, frankly, because you know so many teams just gratuitously went to black who had no black in the uniforms whatsoever. And um, if ever a ship had sailed, it was that. And yeah. when they started using them the first time, now just just get those get things out of here. my sight. Get out of They're here. Smartest. That's what they are. Do, do you ever think <laughs> – sometimes I get a little fed up with how much the Mets – have continually paid homage to the previous franchises and City Field practically being a, a shrine to the Dodgers and Jackie Robinson. And, and then you add in, you know, the, the, the controversy with the Tom Seaver statue and whatnot. Sometimes I feel like we got to remember, you know, we're our own franchise and we got to talk about the Mets. Well, that's why I'm so passionate when it comes to the uniforms, because those uniforms are perfect. Frankly, and, and look, I, I, I get the way the world works nowadays. Alternate uniforms are, are a thing. They're here. But we've got beautiful blue alternate tops. You can tweak those too, play around a little bit if you want. But Or why don't um, we just do uh, the Mercury Mets? Why don't we do 162 of those? Oh, my God. <laughs> I actually had to wear it. Not wear I didn't wear it. I had to Ugh. show it on camera. I was doing TV with Fran Healy that night. Yeah. And I'll show you how dumb I am. Um, they throw me this jersey. They say, show the jersey, show the jersey. So we're on camera and I hold it up. And as I'm holding it up, I say, wait a minute, what, what number did I get? And I turn around and it's 21. I go, yeah, Cleon. I'm feeling real good about getting Cleon Jones's number until I realized, dumbbell, that the 21 is because the entire project was sponsored by Century 21. 21. <laughs> so I'm going, oh, Cleon. I mean, everybody would have had a 21 in the booth. But you know, that literally was the worst thing the Mets have ever uh, worn on a field. Boy. Atrocious. The, the players' was, weekend last year wasn't much better, though. The uh, all white. I on that. Yeah, that was. Ooh. That was. There's, there's, there's been some. Pretty, I think we were pretty explicit about our feelings of, of those things in the time last year, too. <laughs> so uh, my original question, though, from 87 till now, uh, what was your favorite team to broadcast for? Well, I wasn't doing play-by-play -play in 87. I probably should have made that clear. I didn't start doing play-by-play -play on full -play. Well, and you know what? Not even not even who you're broadcasting for. Even forget about 87. Just your, your lifetime as a Mets fan. What, what was your favorite team to root for? Well, 1969, okay? That was, mm -hmm. that was everything. 1969 was, and we spent all last year looking back on it, um, the most incredible thing that could ever happen to a 15-year-old fan. Oh, it's you perfect. Have, that is perfect, perfect timing. Seriously. You have yeah. to, uh, right, right. You have to understand what the Mets were, what they had been, what the world was like. Um, I did have a couple of, oh, I don't know why this is, <laughs> we're leaning on them, but there were so many great books last year that I can, I can show you about, uh, the 1969 Mets. I can reach back right here. Yeah. Don't mind me. I'm just fooling around here. Um, <laughs> we got Art Shamsky's book here. Mm -hmm. Back this up. There you go. This was a great one. Wayne Coffey's book here. This is a great one, and um, I think I had I think I gave somebody where I live here Ron Swoboda's book too. Here's the catch: all three of those books were fabulous, and um, you'll really learn about the '69 Mets if you um, if you didn't know the what the world was like then and where the Mets yeah. fit in. Yeah, I mean that year just in the city in general in '69 was absolutely crazy, yeah. right? And then add yeah. on the, the championship, it's nuts. But. But my favorite Mets season, apart from championship seasons, mm -hmm. 1984. Ah. When they broke through in 84, I mean, they were bad from 77 through 82. You could start to see some things coming together after they got Keith in 83 and Daryl came up that year. 
won the rookie of the year. You can see some pieces starting to come together, but we didn't know going into 84 that they were going to win 90 games and stay in the race most of the year in an era before there was a wild card. But just to see what they were establishing in 84 and knowing it was going to get even better, um, boy, was that an exciting season. That was yeah. just great. We always talk about our favorite teams on this pod, and I always come back to – I think a lot of people do. When it's your own homegrown guys, and you have a couple of veterans like Keith, mm-hmm. but like 2004 to 05, and you're like, this guy right and this guy Reyes we've been hearing about, they're yeah. showing it, they're the guys. And then 06 came, and we're like, the next five years, we're going to be on top of the world. And yeah. You really never know how if you're going to get to the promised land and how long it's going to last. And I even think that's part of the reason why I have a very special place in my heart for Harvey because he was the first – you know, tr- leaf on the tree after just nothing for years. Yeah, for the for this bunch, you mean? Yes, for this bunch. Yeah, well, and- this I'm glad you brought. You know what? This group right now, and we've got a lot of homegrown kids on this team, right? You know, you go from Alonzo to McNeil and Dom Smith, and and um, obviously Degrom. I mean, I remember just so many. You got a real core of homegrown guys, but it's a real, it's a fun group to be around. I mean, mm. like this sort of the dynamic um, that this team produced last year. It was fun. They, they were a loose, fun bunch to be around. Mm-hmm. And they seemed pretty tight. You know, J.D. Davis fit right in. He's not homegrown, but <laughs> let's face it, he's a guy who had his breakthrough years and that last year. Um, I mean, you go position by position. You got first base is homegrown. You've got shortstop is homegrown. McNeil's the third baseman now. That's homegrown. You got Brandon Nimmo, Michael Conforto. I mean, and that's before we get to the pitching. I mean, this is a group that, you know, I, I know the fans have really uh, – sort of grab the grab a hold of and, uh, mm-hmm. and that, that's, that's why I, I wish they would just go do one <laughs> like a, a big free agent splash and and because I you, you do they've done the hard part they've they've grown a lot of talent and they did it a few years earlier with that last regime with the pitching all homegrown if they would just go you know do a pull a Yankees pull a Red Sox overpay somebody get them in here and go in for the kill like now is the time to do it because you did the hard part already well you know, they have overpaid people in the past, and it hasn't yeah. worked out. I and know. You, you can't yeah. assess. Overpay the right guy. <laughs> well, you know, who knew David Wright was going to get hurt, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And, and how things would work out there. And he's just one of the greatest people I've ever met in sports. And, you know, you, you're not supposed to really feel sorry for guys who, you know. No, you know, I hate that. that. I hate but, that narrative. But David Wright, let me tell you, yeah. really bad. David, uh, yes, career. of course. We're not talking. Yeah, they're not. The they're not starving at the end of the day. And yeah, I don't feel that bad right. for them. But their life was this game, and they should have. He should have had so much better. Of course, you feel bad for him. He's yeah. an angel. He's an angel, he Howie. An, He's an yeah. angel sent to this world to play baseball for us, and he was taken far too soon. Oh, which kind of takes us. Well, He's still around, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, which kind of. To, to kind of reflect off Kevin's original question about your favorite thing, like was there a team that you just hated, you know, or, or like kind of a maybe an era? Because there we have this bracket here, the, uh-huh. Mets, the Mets misery bracket. It's 64 moments in Mets history. And to be honest, Nolan Ryan getting traded isn't on the list. There's a bunch of things that didn't even make this bracket that was put together. You could do 100 brackets about the Mets. I think we all know that. Was mm-hmm. there a team, a time – I'm, I'm yes. sound like the Mets the marketing team, the department. The time, the Mets. <laughs> the place. The Mets. That you kind yes, of just like, well, those are the dark days. Yes, 92, 93. Ugh, that, was, awesome. that was embarrassing. I mean, that yeah. was just a bad bunch. It was it was put together poorly. And, you know, unfortunately, that's, you know, that's when Al Harrison was the general manager. And I'm not trying to dump on Al now, but he was just, he was miscast as – as a, as a GM, because when you're putting a team together, you have to take into account how these pieces fit, you know, for people who just want to go out and spend money and trade and buy and get the biggest names. That you, but you got to consider the personalities. You got to consider the people who are there, who's running the club and just how things are going to fit. That was a, a, a really, uh, I hate to use a double adverb, but a, a poorly contrived team. Um, and, yeah, you know and, what? Yeah, we don't do double adverbs here. You're off the show. <laughs> Kick them off. We're, we're done. Because you know it sounds like I'm just going out of my way to dump on Al Harrison, and I'm not because Al could have been a lot of things in this game. He could have been the commissioner. I truly believe that. Uh, Al Harrison, mm. very bright guy, 
who I believe had worked in the commissioner's office for a while, who was extremely well versed on the CBA, who also had a business and marketing background. Um, you can't tell me that 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 Rob Manfred has any deeper a resume than than Al Harrison would have if Al had stayed in the game in a different capacity. And he had the choice when the Mets let him go as general manager. He was given the option to stay on in the organization in a different front office role. He turned it down and never worked in baseball again. I'm sure of his own volition because he could have had chances, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's too bad. They did him a, a disservice, I think, Frank Cashin did, by making Al the GM. He, Al Harrison could have been the commissioner. That the, really the 92 and three team that was like the, the the worst team money could buy right that was yeah, their their moniker bad, yeah that was bad. Uh, yeah. how do you uh how do you kind of reconcile in your head you know let's say in that i think it was 93 was vince coleman with the firecracker and and when you know there's been plenty of athletes have you know to arrests and disputes and when you are are on a broadcast for a guy like that you know and he hits a big home run or or the game winning hit and it's put in the books but there is some element of off the field, you know, uh, you know, something you don't like about him. Do you just kind of put that out of sight, out of mind, or is that you part of your? Yeah, you have to, because my job's to call the game. Right. My job's to report on what's in front of me, and so it doesn't matter if I like this player or not, or you know, if I think that he's giving the team fair value, commensurate with what he's making, whatever that even matters. No, my job is to report. And when something's going on on the field, that's what I become a reporter. We, as broadcasters, are charged with not only reporting, but doing so in a manner that hopefully makes it interesting, entertaining, and above all, accurate. But personal feelings when you're calling a play cannot come into it at all. That's fine, How You take care of that. We'll do the other side where we just rip these guys <laughs> to shreds. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Yeah, we got each other's backs, I guess, huh? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, uh, if you had to give me one player that you did love, uh, personal feelings included, uh, who out of everyone you've ever worked with or, or done a game for, who would it be? Too easy, David Wright. Yeah. I mean, David All right, Wright, forget David. He's just too goddamn good. <laughs> David and Adam Graves of the Rangers are essentially the same person. Hmm. Um, they just have done so much for – uh, the communities around New York during their years when Adam was with the Rangers and, and David with the Mets. And I'm telling you, David, that last game that he played uh, at the end of the 2018 season, I mean, he comes up in the booth and spends a half that hour cool. meeting with us in full uniform. <laughs> and he's like a little, he's like a little kid. I think he enjoyed being in a broadcast booth. Not that he yeah. wants to do it professionally, but I think he really enjoyed the experience of being in the booth. But, you know, the one one memory I have, two, two things of David, uh, memories of David, just to illustrate the kind of person he is. And, and the first one I'll give you is not so much about me because I heard this story from so many other people. Um, David's the kind of guy, having lunch, we're on the road someplace, whatever city. I'm having lunch, I'm by myself. I got a newspaper, a magazine, whatever. I'm reading it. I don't even realize David's in the restaurant. Uh, I ask for the check. Um, waitress says, I'm sorry, the check's already been picked up. And she points David out at wherever he was sitting. And David gives me a little smile. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, man, I have to do that. Thank you very much. Well, I said, I'm going to get you, though. I'm going to someday we're going to be in a restaurant. I'm going to be able to do the same thing. Um, but then, you know, you know, over a course of a few years, other people, and, and I'm not talking about broadcasters with the team, reporters who covered the team, same thing. If they're, David's just that kind of guy, just a mm -hmm. wonderful person. But the night that he came back in Philadelphia and after about four months off, uh, hits that home run into the second deck in left field in Philly. Waterworks for me. Goosebumps right now, I feel him. I was tearing I told up. David after the game, I took the bus back to the hotel with the ball club. And David was sitting right behind me on the bus. And this is a few minutes before we got going. I just turned around and said, David, I could count on one hand and probably wouldn't need every finger to imagine or recall the number of times that I have actually felt goosebumps while I was making a call. And that home run was one of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the way, uh, the way he reacted was everything David Wright was about. He just seemed so 
genuinely touched by that. And believe me, you could say stuff like that to other athletes and they would, you know, just kind of give you a, a profound or whatever. Advice, you know? Yeah. But David, you can just tell he was so touched and, and David was just such a part of this organization in every way. He was so close to Shannon Ford, may she rest in peace. And, and, you know, it was just such a, uh, a shoulder for her throughout the, the ordeal that she went through. And, but he's like that. He's been like that to everybody. He's just a very, very special person. And, um, He's a hell of a ball player, too. I think sometimes people <laughs> yeah. forget. When yep. he was healthy, he was awesome. Of course. I don't even know the number two is even close. Yeah. What was uh, any other uh, goosebump moments come to mind? Yeah, ironically, because when I mentioned that to David, it was in August of 2015, two months later. Well, I'll give you two. I'll back it up to 2012 when Santana struck out David Fries to complete the no-hitter. I couldn't even believe the ball. I mean, you <laughs> – You've been waiting for that. <laughs> yeah, that Gary's call was perfect. You know, just three words. It has happened. Yeah. Um, Do you know Kevin didn't tell his mom that the uh, winner was going on, so he didn't no. jinx it? Oh, Diehard Mets fan, and he didn't even tell his mom. So my mom missed it. My mom is like her father, and then her are the reason why, for better or worse, I'm a Mets fan. And you know, she she doesn't she's not as obsessive anymore in her older age. She doesn't watch every game, but we talk. She watches a lot. And we talk a lot. And I, I got superstitious, and I didn't want to tell her. And so, you know, as soon as that final out's recorded, I call her up. I said, were you watching? She said, watching what? I said, the message through no hitter. <laughs> she, she did not talk to me for two straight weeks. I'm surprised she didn't disown you. Uh, she was – I've never felt worse. Like, it wasn't – it was not a joke. It was not, like, a funny thing she was doing. She was – that was bad. That was a dark time. That was bad. <laughs> well, as an aside, I may need you guys to help me with something because – I was very embarrassed by my work that night because I had always been very upfront and would deliver the words verbatim. So-and-so has a no-hitter through six. I would use the words no-hitter. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what possessed me this particular night. I have no idea why. But as this thing on, you know, started to come into focus, I remember saying probably around the fourth or fifth inning because Yohan had walked several batters early yeah. in that game and was on a strict pitch count, you know, that whole backstory. But I said, you know, if you think tonight's going to be the night, forget it because Terry Collins is not going to stay with him long enough. And anyway, now it's at the sixth inning, the seventh inning, and I'm saying stuff like, well, the Mets have all the runs and all the hits. And I found uh -huh. every way, you know, I would say – Six, eight, and one for the Mets, and zeros across for the car. But I would never say no hitter, and that bothered me to this day. That's why it happened, Howie. Yeah. No, it's not. Yes, it's it not. is. You got to take it's credit. Not. We got to spin because, this thing. <laughs> because for years before, I had done the same thing. I had not said no hitter, and they had never pitched a no hitter. And so, I mean, and, and then when I started to do it, Turk Wendell used to get on me all the time. And Turk's a great guy. <laughs> Turk's a lot of times a year, <laughs> fantasy camp. But, um, you know, I could say somebody's got a no-hitter going in the fifth or sixth inning. And the next day, Turk would come to me going, what were you doing, man? Well, I mean, <laughs> that, that is the least of Turk's superstitions. So, yeah. <laughs> as we but know. But the other one was, yeah, when, when they won the pennant. And, yeah. um, you know, I got to say – as Familia struck out Dexter Fowler, the Mets win the pennant. <laughs> Those words came out of my mouth and sh sent shivers down my spine. Was that more, uh, you know, compared to the 2000 team, that uh, that pennant? No, well, I didn't like... do play by play in the. You weren't doing that, right? right. Doing oh, right. Play -play. Obviously, that's right. So we couldn't do play by. That's play -by. a beauty of radio, huh? I mean, it's got to kill yeah, Gary it. that he just is on the sidelines, yeah. just like, well, you know, look, I, I went through that in 2000, but that's what you sign up for. Mm -hmm. you know, when, I, when I was doing TV, I knew that I was not going to be able to do the games in the postseason. And yeah, that, that hurt, but you got used to it. There's so nothing comes close to doing the game, but what you sign up for. Are you watching the games with like Alyssa and the family when you're off during the playoffs and living and dying and all that kind of stuff? Because I mean, then? Yeah. Back then. Well, I guess she's. I'm well, now I'm doing them if they're right. in. I'm doing yeah. Them. But I'm saying back then, are you just like, what, what do you like when oh, you're, no, you're away saying. and you're at home and you have to live and die, but you don't have a microphone in front of you? I wasn't home. I was working because what we would do would be pre and post game shows. Hmm. And I'll tell you a funny story about the Ventura game, you know, the Grand Slam single. Um, we were not allowed 
to go on the air until whichever network was televising the game signed off. But they would sign off pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so we watched the game in the old control room, which was adjacent to the Kiner's Corner studio, uh, right next to the clubhouse, the, the Mets clubhouse at Shea Stadium. So I'm watching the game on, on TV in the control room, and I saw Ventura hit the ball over the wall. I forget what the score was. What, what was it? It was 6-6 um, six, six or something like that? Something along those lines, yeah. Because I think the final score was 7-6. Seven, 7-6, seven, six, six, yeah. So anyway, he hits the home run. It's a grand slam. As soon as that ball went over the wall, though, we had to hightail out of that control room and set up on the field. Oh, so, for... so you think it's a home so run? Now, yeah. So <laughs> I saw the ball go over the wall, and I, I bolted. So now I'm setting up. Okay, I'm in place. My camera's straight. And I just happen to look over my shoulder. I see the scoreboard. It says 7-6. And I look at Healy. I go, hey, Fran. I said, Ventura hit that ball over the wall, right? He goes, yeah. I said, how does the score 7-6? And then the truck or the control room, they say, no, no, Pratt cut him off. He only got, he got <laughs> Thank God they told me that in the truck because I Imagine. had no idea. Imagine. Oh, wow. thoughts, and, thoughts and prayers to everyone who had that that bet too. Oh. I, mean, like, I couldn't imagine losing my ticket on, on the Gamblers that oh, night. Goodness. Over under whatever. Gracious. <laughs> Well, uh, it's it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure talking to you, Howie. Although I, 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 a little birdie did just text me and said, uh, what about the time Ralph met Jamie Lee Curtis? Well, oh, that's a great story. What um, happened there? <laughs> this is a, Well, all right. Jamie Lee Curtis's mom was a very well-known actress named Janet Lee. And Janet Lee was married to Tony Curtis, another well-known actor. And that's how Jamie became Jamie Lee Curtis. But anyway, around the time that they were filming the classic movie, Trading Places, do um, you know that movie with Eddie Murphy mm -hmm. and Dan Aykroyd? You guys got to watch it. You don't have good recall, I could tell. You've got to watch it. It's a classic. <laughs> See anyway, Trading Places. <laughs> anyway, then you didn't like it as much? No, I do. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just uh, interested in the story. Oh, all right. So <laughs> the Mets are in Philadelphia. I was not broadcasting this, this game. I, was, I wasn't doing the games yet. So I'm going to say this is around 1982 because the movie came out in 83. I've heard this story a million times from several people. But uh, Ralph goes into the press room at the old veteran stadium with his wife after a game. And he notices Jamie Lee Curtis is in the room. And Ralph says to his wife, hey, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, I dated her mom. Janet Lee. And Ralph's wife says, why don't you go over and introduce yourself? She'd probably get a kick out of hearing that. And Ralph, you know, Ralph, believe it or not, was kind of a shy guy. <laughs> and he didn't, he didn't feel comfortable doing that, but Diane prodded him and um, he did. And so Ralph goes over and Jamie's got no idea he's coming or maybe even who he is. And Ralph goes, uh, Jamie, I just want to say hi. My name is Ralph Kiner and I dated your mom, Janet Lee, back in the 50s or your mom back in the 50s. And she doesn't know it's coming. Jamie jumps into Ralph's arms, throws her arms around him, and says, Daddy! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Wow. I love that story. That's a special one. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's been a, a, a cast of characters uh, involved in that organization for a long time, and you are right yeah. at the top of that list, man. Yeah, you are – you're one of the best in the game, and I, I don't like I said. There's not a Mets fan alive who doesn't love you. So appreciate That's all that nice. you do, because I do feel like a lot of people sometimes might not realize or think about. You know, you're on the road just as much as they are, the players, and and you know, it's it's a, a nightly grind for you just as much as anybody in baseball. So, uh, you know, probably a little bit of a thankless job at times, but we want to thank you because it's been great. It's all to you. good. So you think this Twitter – I appreciate that. You think this Twitter idea of mine is, is okay? Oh, listen. You're going to get cooking on Twitter, and, and the people are going to love it. You start to tell some of these stories. Let me know about, you know, what, like, Kevin Kevin Mitchell was doing in the 80s and talk to me about the, <laughs> the bad guys one and, and, the, and the, the down years and the dark stories and the behind the curtains. People will be following you left and right, man. Patience, patience. You can't empty it all out. <laughs> You're right. Open, you you got to leave them wanting you know, more. How does this stuff work, by the way? I went on. I established – that I was going on Twitter, I think, Saturday. Mm -hmm. I think it was Saturday. And in the first 24 hours, 
I had like 20,000 followers and I'm thinking, geez, that's pretty good, I think. Yeah. And then, you know, it's been kind of drips and drabs since then. So I'm feeling like, well, what, what, what am I doing wrong here? I hit a, I, I scored five in the first inning. I haven't had a hit since. <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? Well, what's you got, cool? so you get the first wave of Mets fans who, who are, yeah. who are obsessed with not only Twitter, but you, and now you got to start to earn, uh, earn the rest. And, you know, we'll start yeah. to retweet you and put the stories out there. But I really believe, you know, just the other day, Mike Francesa did it. Or whoever you know, whether it was Mike or his team, I don't know. But he started to no tweet. Team. I'm yeah, the that's team. why. Yeah, but it's better this way. You are the Actually, team. I'm not. And it comes to, it's my technical listen. advisor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you start to tell, you know, he was telling behind the scenes stories and mentioning classic games or embracing yeah. some of the inside jokes. People love that, man. They love it. Yeah. It's the connection. We'll get to that. Yeah, you. There's plenty of time right now, huh? Doses. Yeah. Yeah. yeah can't, can't do it all at once, right? All right. I, wow. I also read your tweets in your voice. Yeah. So like you tweet something out. It makes me happy. It soothes me. It's going to soothe everyone else. We just got to just, just stick away from the, stay away from the politics. Other than that, you're yeah. gonna be don't do politics. <laughs> don't do politics. You know what you should do? You should do some, do some videos because what Clem said is right. It's that voice. If you do a little play by play for just stuff going on around the house, you tell me, uh, you know, maybe maybe do a little reading, a little reading hour where you put it in your book. I don't know. There's there's a lot of ways you, you can start <laughs> to incorporate. Yeah, so I, I could take pictures of his beard as it continues to come and drips and drops. A little a little day by day update of, of how he's beard. Sure. All right. Well, today was a big day because the bananas ripened today. So uh, after four days of watch green, it's a little less green. It's a little less green. Yes. As, that's the entertainment. Do, you know what? Give me some play-by-play -play on the bananas ripening. We'll go viral, all right? It's come to that, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in Thank the you so much. Uh, Thank you, guys. And, Stay uh, come on whenever you want, and let's hopefully uh, hopefully there'll be bits in baseball soon. And until then, stay safe. Stay safe. All stay right, sane. Guys. Have a good one. Be good. Thanks. Cool. All right. Well, that's Kev. Hope you guys had enjoyed that. That was, I don't know. That was fucking awesome. I was basically uh, Chris Farley just looking at Paul McCartney and just being like, yes, on the Chris Farley show. Um, I think I think we covered a bunch of stuff. We didn't cover. Like, I have notes here. If we can get him back on, I want to just talk. I could talk the Matteau, Matteau, Matteau call for like 10 minutes straight. We try to keep it Met-centric. There's Again, with the Mets, there's plenty of – Stuff to talk about. Um, who's Clem tonight? Got to be Howie Rose. That would be fun. That voice, it really is. It's just, what do they say? Peanut butter with velvet. That's the uh, that commercial that I think it was Joe Buck commercial back in the day. Howie's a walking encyclopedia. Awesome guy. Awesome dude. Um, so we're going to – we'll get this out on the podcast for everyone who couldn't hear it. And uh, if you guys could do more stuff like that, it would be great. Yeah, we're going to try to get more guests on. We've actually had a few guests that were either coming on – uh, we had a pushback, obviously, once all this nonsense uh, kind of exploded. Um, but we have some people coming on, I think, in a week or so. We have a guest that has not been announced yet, at least as of now. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we have we still have a full bracket worth of shit to go through. But the, we're kind of leaving the bracket with a straight-up coffee stain that's very on point for, like, a bracket, I feel. Um, we're going to have uh, – we're going to try to, like, get some interviews so we're just not leaning on the bracket and all that stuff. Do you guys like the bracket? Laduka? I'm, I'm sure Paul will come back at some point. Um, do you guys like the bracket pods where we kind of just go down the wormhole of, I mean, I, you guys love it? Yes, yes. Okay, that's what I'm getting. Thumbs up. Um, yeah, uh, just kind of going down the wormhole of the internet and just reliving some of the shit that, I mean, my brain probably is blocked out of my mind to prevent me from drinking bleach. Um Okay, so we're going to keep that going. Uh, Lasting's Village. Yeah, I, at this point, I almost feel like getting, obviously, the legends like Howie, and then you have players, X and, and future, or X and current and past, and then, like, even the kind of quirky part of the Mets world, whether it's um, a Lasting's Millage. We want to have maybe some people from Mets Twitter come on. Obviously, we've had Darren, Darren in the past. Uh, stuff like that. And any suggestions, just let us know. Tweet at us and – the thing about Barstool is we have grown enough where I think we have a little bit of cachet and a little bit. I mean, we got fucking Howie Rose just on the show. I can't believe that just happened. <laughs> so uh, Gary, Keith, Bartolo. I mean, that's like that's a holy trinity in itself right there. I just said um, 
cowbell man. <laughs> there, there's a lot of ways we can go. We basically just go to the quarantine house or in the Mets misery bracket and pick someone out. Jason Bay, wherever the fuck that guy is. Um, Luis Castillo, oh, that would be tough. Uh, anyone we could get on the pod that you guys want, hit us up at Gotta Believe Pod or hit me up at the Clem Report, obviously, Cav KFC Barstool. Um, I mean, we're all in this together, kind of like we said with Howie, us Mets fans. We don't have the Mets bring misery into our lives, so let's try to bring some happiness into our lives by, I guess, reliving that misery. That's one way to go about it. Um, I also think we have to give Howie a Mets uh, – the the Mets um, – the anarchy, the anarchy uh, patch. So we're going to, we'll, we'll come up with that next time uh, on the pod. So uh, got to believe, got to believe. <laughs>